Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the latest Temple Bar Trust online talk. I'm Lucy Bullivant, a trustee of Temple Bar Trust, and I have curated the Trust's online series of talks since last July. Now, as many of you are already aware, and uh, newcomers will not maybe be so aware, the Trust's chief aim is the promotion of architecture in the square mile to wide public through a regular program of talks and tours. And equally important is our focus um, in our work, um, supporting greater diversity in the architecture and the built environment professions which um, is really a subject of profound and urgent significance that we are addressing um, as part of all of our events. So presenting on online our talks really is an interim measure until we can actually get back to using our um, beloved Temple Bar, the architectural gateway to the city, which the Trust manages, which is designed by Sir Christopher Wren, or was some many, many decades and, and centuries ago on Paternoster Square. So the building is also home to our associated worshipful company of chartered architects, of which I am a liveryman, yes indeed. And we look forward to enjoying this space for meetings, dining and entertainment, hopefully in the not too distant future. So for updates, please check the Trust website, Temple Bar Trust, Org, where you can see all our talk videos and our, our film series um, initiated from uh, early spring this year, as well as all future events. So virtual talks and walks are all publicised there. So I am today really delighted to welcome our speaker, Sana Sheikh, who is an architect, an educator and an activist with a real passion for inclusion in the built environment. A dem a, demonstrated uh, passion as well um, through many projects and the founder of her, of Native Studio, which is her RIBA chartered design and architecture practice. And I'm very happy in addition that this is our second event that we're st staging as part of the London Festival of Architectures 2021 program. It takes the theme of care and exhortation to all of us to care more about our environments and each other. So a little bit about Sana, through her cross-cutting work, she explores the various ways in which buildings colonize urban spaces, impacting users, environmental priorities and future generations, and how alternative approaches to facilitate wider public uh, participation can help avoid or at least mitigate the impact of spatial exclusion. So after graduating from the Bartlett and the Architectural Association, she worked with various London-based practices. She was a partner at MAKE for five years, leading large-scale commercial projects in the Bahamas, Mumbai, Birmingham, and then practiced at Studio Agro West on larger scale master plans and residential projects in London. And she's worked very hard to encourage wider participation in the built environment by marginalized groups, collaborating with the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust, the Construction Youth Trust, Open City, East London Schools and Manchester Museum. She, uh, not too long ago, co-founded Decosm, which is a space-making collective that brings together spatial practitioners to appraise the process of uh, colonization. Sana teaches at Central St. Martins and examines architecture at Oxford Brookes University and the AA. So very briefly, not to give away too much, um, in her talk, Decolonizing Urban Spaces, she will interrogate how architects can go about designing to be truly inclusive and holistic and steer clear of erroneous top-down assumptions that only serve to perpetuate spatial inequity. So what are the fundamentals of empathy to achieve a wider social impact? And what critical questions about different community contexts must be explored throughout the design process in order to achieve first-rate human-centered design? So after Sana's spoken for about half an hour, 
or so we'll have some dialogue between us and then we'll have a Q&A with you so please do put your questions to her in the chat box so thank you very much Sana and over to you well, thanks Lucy for a great introduction um yeah so as um, Lucy's I think kind of introduced everything about me um yeah I'm founder of Native Studio and I'm going to talk today about, about a few things. So firstly, I'm going to cover some of the research I've been doing um, about colonization of urban space, which is partly aligned with the think tank design research collective I'm a part of called Decosm. And I'm then going to look at ways that we can have a more inclusive approach within our current design process, and then describe some of the projects we've been developing at Native Studio that start to manifest some of those ideas. So firstly, um, if we start looking at how we understand colonization. The practice of architecture is inherently ridden with multiple acts of colonization. A site is found, a use is attributed, a new group of people settle, and materials and structures, both physical and non-physical, are imposed. Both historically, from the European colonization of Asia, Africa, the Americas and beyond, to our present day, as we destroy the earth for future generations and encounter new territories, Spatial interventions continue to manifest colonization in multiple ways. So by examining and deconstructing the forms and processes involved in colonization, we can begin to understand its wider impact on individuals and how this can extend into our urban spaces with a hope to start addressing how we can limit these negative impacts, I think. Um, so firstly, if we look at what it means to decolonize, to colonize, <laughs> Colonization refers to the actions of settling among, exploiting and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area, appropriating a place and its resources for one's own use. Within a global and historical context, the legacy of colonization highlights the occupation of Europe over much of the world, as we can see in this map, where you can see um, the areas highlighted in green show um, everywhere in the world that has been directly affected by European colonization or, or impacted it by it. And this has established Europe as the dominant global culture on multiple levels. So if we look at the direct definitions of what it means to colonize and how this might relate to the built environment. So to settle, when a type of building and its associated users settle in a place to a, in a place unfamiliar to, low, to a locality, imposing a new character for the place, this is commonly seen over London in the newer, much denser tower blocks in areas of lower rise, more varied buildings. And similarly, on places like Brick Lane, the influx of new services and chains begin to settle among the traditional services custom to the area to exploit. So changing the use of land for benefit of those who are not from the locality. So this was very evident in the Olympic legacy, where it was suggested that the land prior to development was not used, had no existing communities, and therefore was making positive use out of this wasteland. But the land was actually home to numerous green spaces, allotments, markets, and various uses to existing communities. And the change also incurred quite a big loss of um, biodiversity. As the area accumulated more development, buildings were improved and consequently densified or maximized to provide maximum benefit to developers rather than what might be appropriate for the site and its existing residents. So to control, changing the makeup of an area by pushing groups out and installing organizations and companies that those from the area don't benefit from, like the tenants of Elephant and Castle, moving different ethnic groups and migrant traders away from the area to make way for a different group of people, controlling the movement and types of services that are available. To appropriate for one's own use, in this example in Hackney Wick, we can see how existing buildings have been appropriated for workspace that may now be sold and rented for financial gain, rather than the, the original workspace that existed that was once affordable and appropriate for these existing communities. So if we delve a little deeper into these examples, we can begin to think about the multiple forms of colonization and the effects it can have on societies and people by breaking it down into the physical, social, the economic and political. So this diagram begins to explore how these ideas might be related. And so we'll now take a look at some examples past and present. So perhaps the form we're most familiar with is that of a physical, to build or shape a space so historically, the imposition of physical buildings designed in a style of the colonizers and imposition of infrastructure, which only serves the colonizers interest, are consistent physical manifestations of colonialism within the spaces in which they occupy. 
And in the urban context of London, these red line boundaries, which create development plots, areas which developers or planners dictate, create boundaries and divisions through the materials they use and the ownership, isolating them from the wider context and colonising a specific area which might have numerous effects on the context around it. Politically, the governance of colonisers ensured submission from local people and an adherence to their method of ruling, removing empowerment and any ability to dictate their native environment. And in an urban context, the political decisions of councils and government dictate who lives there, who loses their homes, who is displaced, and the communities that are broken. Social forms of colonisation took form in various ways. The social hierarchy created by colonisers around race and class fed into society as the colonised were consistently rejected, deemed inferior, therefore aspired to become their colonisers, both in appearance through retaining lighter skin colour and often by mimicking the colonised cultures in place of their own. And in an urban context, this might mean that the cultural activities that once took place no longer do, as they've been made to feel inferior or inappropriate. So Bengali weddings in Brick Lane are much fewer as the character of the street is changing. The nature of the food sold in Spitalfields no longer appeals to the people to the local people who were once who were once there, as it's catering for those who've recently moved to the area. Economic colonization occurred in various ways, but ultimately left those colonies poor and impoverished. Famines in India and extreme poverty that the country continues to recover from as the British extracted resources from the country to fund their own. And the graph here directly shows the correlation between European colonialism and subsequent wealth with the poverty of both China and India. And in an urban context, gentrification and the pricing out of local people from their neighbourhoods, both in terms of affordable homes and also the cost of local goods and services, which then become unaffordable. So having analysed these various forms of colonisation, the next layer we can uncover looks at coloniality. To quote Mal Maldonado Torres, coloniality survives colonialism. It is maintained alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the self-image of peoples, in aspirations of self and so many other aspects of our modern experience. In a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality in all the time and every day. He describes three elements coloniality of power, knowledge, and of being. Coloniality of power refers to the power held by a dominant group and structure, and therefore its ability to exploit. Coloniality of power sees a single society or group as superior, progressive, and universal. Coloniality of knowledge refers to the impact of colonization on the different areas of knowledge production, which essentially prioritize knowledge production of the colonialists and oppressing any forms of knowledge production that are different to their own. Coloniality of being refers to the lived experience of colonization, where invisibility and dehumanization are the primary expressions, because when you are being colonized, you're not seen as human and your being is invisible to colonizers and the people in power. And this starts to relate to how, he, to how we might feel about our built environment, um, feeling inadequate in certain spaces, in certain materials, in, in specific surroundings and, and groups. So in this final diagram, I've begun to collate these various layers of colonialism that I've discussed and how we and so we've now understood how they can be manifested spatially in the built environment and how this can also affect our, indiv our individual response to space as a the result of the legacy of colonialism. So these ideas can begin to challenge how we understand spaces in our city. Um, and so if we if we take that and look at an example, we could take a look at um, the Haygate estate and the development of that. So if we look at some of the data um, around the Haygate estate, we can see that there were originally around 1200 socially rented homes, but the new development was able to provide 2700 homes of which only 82 were actually socially rented. 80% of the homes were sold to overseas buyers. Um, 2950 Londoners were displaced and only 45 of the original tenants were rehoused and one in five of the tenants remained in the postcode. And additionally, the loss of a mature urban forest containing hundreds of mature trees. Um, and it was found that about 283 of the 400 mature trees had to be felled to make way for the redevelopment. 
Similarly, if we look at the example of the Thames, we can see that 77% of the river crossings are in the wealthier boroughs, limiting access for residents and giving them longer journeys. The Thames path doesn't extend through East London boroughs, so limiting access to the river. And the average price of a home um, that has access to the river is 57% higher than the standard. So these kinds of answers begin to reframe how we can view our built environment and have been part of um, the research collective uh, developed by D D by the research <laughs> developed by research collective Decosm, which is led by Umi Baden Powell, Neba Sarah, and myself. And our research collective seeks to interrogate the process of colonization, pushing the process of decolonization in order to create truly equitable cities and space making. And this work specifically is elaborated upon in the alternative catalogue that's part of the How We Live Now exhibition at the Barbican. So please do go, go and take a look at that. So um, once we begin to understand the impact of the, these layers of colonisation on our built environment, how do we approach designing cities? Inevitably, to build is to colonise. New groups will move into an area and that's natural and part of and parcel of how cities evolve. But, but how can this be done in the least intrusive way? That can, and that can in fact benefit existing contexts and communities. So there have been various reports and methods of measurement considering the impact of assessment of aspects like gentrification, and these reinforce much of the discussion made so far. So from Dr. Bridget Snaith's White All Green Spaces to Runnymede's report that creates an equation for gentrification, um, you know, some studies have called for social impact assessments to be undertaken. And while this is really positive, often these kinds of exercises just become about ticking boxes. So how can designers take a more holistic approach? At Native Studio, we've looked at ways in which the design process can begin to create a more inclusive environment. We collaborate with practitioners and community and communities such as Insider Outsider, experts in collaborative design. We adopt a human-centered design approach that addresses the needs of the widest possible range of people and where possible involving participants from the outset with an approach rooted in cultural context and lived experience with local people at the heart. So how can a design team incorporate principles of inclusion and human-centered design within their process? So let's look at how the design project is structured and we can break it down loosely. Um, but when we do this, it's also important to consider that it's not just about designers. All of us have a voice with which, within which we can shape our cities. We're all the experts of our own lived experience, and that should always be considered in this process. And we can, we do have the power to comment on planning applications, write to our local councillors. And if we begin to understand how the design process can incorporate us better, we can communicate that to those around us and hopefully make meaningful change. So looking at the design process, Obviously, we start with um, early design stages where the project is defined and the brief is developed. And the main aims of this stage, um, as defined uh, by our uh, Reba stages, is, is on the left. But if we start developing these and, and thinking about how we can approach them in a more meaningful way, what if client requirements considered the existing users of the site and locality and their requirements, as well as the new users? Understanding the feasibility of the scheme as not just being from the view of the client, but also that of the existing community? Will they be priced out? Will they have access to services and amenities that they need? Further to this, can the feasibility of the project be understood not just from an economic perspective, but an environmental and social perspective? And in terms of project aspirations, what does the future look like for existing residents? What are their aspirations for their neighbourhood, their community and their families? Can the future not just maintain their existing network and living standards, but enhance it? and looking at networks and connections beyond red line boundaries, understanding the wider impact of a project. Ultimately, how does the brief consider the widest range of users who will be affected by the scheme? And it's by asking these questions at the outset that projects can begin to become more inclusive. So when we start looking at developing the design concept and coordination, the importance of a diverse design team to ensure the needs of these diverse communities, whether it be race or gender or religion, um, can then be reflected in the design. Understanding the cultural context of the site through working with local people, their lived experiences, and looking at how this could be manifested within the proposals, be it through material choices, forms or colours or textures or access. Adopting these methodologies allows a project to reflect the local identity created by local people, providing a sense of belonging for communities going through change. 
And by contributing towards their built environment, people can feel a sense of ownership, empowerment, and ultimately feel more included. As the design developed, the design reviews by local community groups, um, as well as people with accessibility concerns, again, allows for projects to consider needs of the widest range of people, encouraging and allowing for social cohesion. Working with the wider design team through spatial coordination also raises numerous opportunities for inclusion, ensuring standards consider how people generally use and experience space. An example of that might be in the assumed temperatures and environmental control of an office. There's now quite common knowledge that most of our standards on environmental comfort are based on the metabolism of a 40 year old man. Um, and studies have proven that women are more productive in warmer spaces. So let's start challenging these standards to create more, a more equitable environment for everybody. If we then start looking at the actual construction phase of a project, um, we can investigate and adopt local materials, suppliers and services and benefit local economies, creating jobs and prosperity. Similarly, the construction phase can create opportunities for youth participation, skills training, and help facilitate the change of an area by involving communities through continuous events, updates, and incorporating local services where possible, if you can get them to supply food for the on-site canteen, things like that. Understanding the negative impact on the locality during this phase is also really important, especially in terms of noise, dust, pollution, pedestrian, vehicular traffic, can all have a big impact on how people are going to experience their neighbourhood during construction. And so working through these factors with stakeholders is really important. Future users should also understand how their buildings and spaces are to be used. All too often, the, these health and safety files and building manuals are made for no one to read, resulting in misuse of the building and not understanding the strategies that have been in place, whether it's about fire or opening windows, these strategies need to be really straightforward so everybody can understand them. And finally, if we get to we get to the final stages of handover and use, and in those stages, it's really important to get feedback from the design team, construction team, and most importantly, those who have been affected by the construction and understand how they've been positively and negatively impacted. Conducting what we call post-occupancy evaluations with users and existing communities over the following few years can help understand some of the impact of the project. Gathering data, looking at how the area has changed, movement in and out, change in demographics, house prices and the types of businesses are also great indicators of social and cultural change that can support findings in these post-occupancy evaluations. Understanding the afterlife of the scheme in terms of the management and maintenance of a project is also really important. If there's a sense of community ownership or management to any part of the scheme, it provides the groundwork for further opportunities of community, community participation and empowerment. So these are some of the ways in which we can begin to allow for inclusion in our design process. Ultimately, it's about empathy, understanding that how we build and create should consider people and how they use and experience our built environment. And at Native Studio, we've got a few projects that we've worked on that begin to embed some of these approaches. Obviously, they're very early stages, but it's um, em hopefully embodying some of the approach that we start to discuss here. Um, so, First project, um, Native Studio worked with Insider Outsider to pitch for the East End Women's Museum. And in and our immediate response sought to understand local connections to the proposed site and its surrounding context of barking. We mapped out various potential collaborators and institutions through which we could build relationships with the museum, providing the opportunity for the project to become a community asset. And this began to form the first part of the three main principles for the project. So principle one was about the relationship with the surrounding context. So drawing upon the local connections that we'd mapped out, we could develop a deeper understanding of the existing local context, thinking about what's considered important to the different communities and how a visual and cultural identity specific to the local area could be manifested in our proposed design and also inform some of the evolution of the East End Women's Museum within the context of its home and parking. And these relationships would shape how surrounding public and civic spaces can relate to the proposal. So this could result in potential wayfinding strategies within the surrounding landscape and maybe hosting events that can generate and enhance the stories and narratives that are central to the museum's purpose. So principle two was about flexibility through moving walls. So considering the variety of activities and the evolving nature of the museum, it was proposed that the, state, the space be designed to be as versatile as possible to create an interior to provide maximum flexibility. So this approach also aligned with the informal behavior of many communities within the area and the ability to appropriate space for different activities. 
local community groups can be invited to help determine what some of those activities that go on um, in the museum could be and how they might change and evolve over the lifespan of the museum. Um, during the design process, more specific requirements of interior spaces could be determined collectively um, through the members to ensure inclusion um, and that those members could be represented within the creation of their space, which is a theme that's central to our strategy for inclusion. And finally, principle three, which was about temporary, temporary exhibitions to engage and embed the community. We saw the design, realisation and presence of the East End Women's Museum as an opportunity to nurture and inspire the next generation of creatives with a focus on women. And it was proposed that the opportunity for temporary forms of display were developed, designed and made by local groups of women and children to train and upskill in craft design and construction skills. Temporary exhibition stands made with smaller groups would be visible from the display windows in the spaces that surround the museum. At times, they might spill out onto the public space at its forefront, ensuring that whether the museum is open or closed, it continues to tell the stories of the activities and ideas it beholds, further instilling confidence in participants as they can see their work in a public forum. We took personal accounts of people from who are from or connected to the area to try and bring some of the relevant themes into our design. And these lived experiences and accounts are central to how we develop design. Another example of how we began to try and embed a sense of local identity and context into a, into a project was for the Preston Moss competition. So for this project, we looked at the social context of the diverse religious communities of Preston and the physical context, um, outlining the silhouettes of many of the city's religious buildings against the backdrop of the hills of the Bolan Fells. For us, highlighting the relationship between religion and nature because in many faiths, including Islam, nature reflects the existence of a creator. And thus Preston, with its vast surrounding landscape, provided an environment in which we could explore this relationship. The site also sat on the periphery of the city with an elevated topography, providing great views over the city and landscape, even though it sat in the middle of two quite significant motorways. Um, but it contained a large amount of landscape, including multiple trees of significance. Um, and so the approach was to ensure that all the existing nature be maintained and trying to make it accessible to everybody. Um, as such, uh, in between the, the parking that's required, the landscape provides multiple spaces of contemplation from which to be absorbed in nature, um, while two more intimate gardens sit on either side of the building and each garden space has its own character. So one is more formal, reflecting the order, geometry and precision around religion and it's, how it's conducted, while the other um, was more informal um, and had some play spaces for children, reflecting a more raw, undisturbed connection to spirituality. Both gardens can be entered independently of the mosque and therefore can be used by anybody um, and by not visiting the mosque itself, encouraging a unique use of the site to draw visitors who might not otherwise approach it. And it's proposed each year that the garden could be designed and created by a different landscape designer from Preston, creating new opportunities of interest for the space. So the proposed building form consists of multiple circular stone walls that come together to create the central worship space around which the supporting spaces sit. The multiple walls are positioned in a circular fashion, uniting in the centre to represent the makeup of Preston's varied unique communities as they are brought together to define the city. The stone walls are differentiated by adopting two slightly contrasting local stones from Leeds, and the building's circular form allows a consistent connection to the worship space from everywhere within the building, keeping the most sacred space, the worship space, at its heart. It is also protected by the surrounding ancillary spaces that act as buffers from the noise of the A6 and the M55. The walls are further characterised as they are embossed with different patterns. As with traditional Islamic design, ornament is created through the abstraction of words. And so the patterns represented herein derive from the word faith in three languages, as per the three relevant influences in Preston, um, Iman in Arabic, Manta in Gujarati, and faith itself in English, and it could potentially absorb more. And the scale of which that's visible is should be from, from a distance, so those words can be um, seen from afar. Um, the proposed minaret offers a contemporary take on the form of the minaret, responding and adding to the church spires of the existing skyline, and the minaret's made up of multiple elements that join at the peak, embodying the multiple unique identities of Preston working together as one. 
So these are some of the ways that at Native Studio we've considered inclusion in the built environment in, our, in the early stages of our projects. And where possible, we always try and encourage opportunities for engagement, co-design and discussion with locality, from business residents to those who simply spend time in an area. And it's these conversations and narratives when had with the widest range of groups that provide an understanding of the context within which we're building, which we think is crucial to creating places and spaces that excite and inspire those who live, work and spend time in our cities, to create spaces and places where people really feel that they belong. Thank you. <laughs> oh no, we can't hear Lucy. No, <laughs> we can't hear you, Lucy. Um, yeah, so um, I've just been told uh, one of the questions that's asking about urbanisation being colonial, colonization of um, the physical environment, which I think, yeah, it, it, it very much is so. Um, but obviously we can, which is what I mentioned earlier, that the act of building is a form is colonization within itself so the best we can try and do is to preserve what we do have and trying to have minimal impact on that environment um, so I, I, I do I, th I think it is so it, it's very much about trying to preserve what we do have um, in the best possible way really I think we've lost Lucy <laughs> Perhaps if you write in the chat, I can, I can, um, Um, okay. um, sorry everybody <laughs> a little bit of a delay but um we are we are getting there yeah if if you can put any questions that you might have in the chat um that'd be great hello am i audible again yes you're Wow, yes. I, I mean, I, maybe the system was so in awe of your talk that it uh, <laughs> shut, shut me down. <laughs> okay. Right, so um, let's just backtrack quickly. Um, so that was brilliant, Sana. I just wanted to, to comment um, to the point, I mean, on your, I think it's so very helpful to convey these concepts and additionally to show how a step-by-step -step inclusive ethos can be embedded into all uh, all parts of the design process um, because I think it's really educational for uh, developers wanting to broaden their uh, the ethos as well as architects and other built environment professionals and that moreover you know place strategists um, working in a multidisciplinary um, set context you know place making and place governance to set the legacy so they're, they're engaging with the soft and the hard aspects of planning, as you you know your projects really demonstrate combining around cultural context, local lived experience.
experience and valuing existing community assets. So um, um, we can, we've got a few questions already lined up and you've answered one of them, is that right? I believe so, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so before we go on to those, I've, um, we'll do that momentarily, but I've got a, a couple of questions I wanted to fire off to you. Now, um, uh, the writer Louisa Adua Parker, Adua Parker, when she was discussing the movement to decolonize public spaces, you know, which three years ago in her essay for The Ecologist, and she was talking about taking down statues and plaques and other physical legacies of colonialism, as you can imagine. Um, she made the astute observation that, that now, now decolonization can now be seen as what, part of a wider ethical living movement that calls for, respects for respect for all living beings and the planet and that it's spread into the mainstream. So she reckoned that now we can begin to decolonize every aspect of society, employment, criminal justice and healthcare systems, the media, arts and family. I mean, that's quite, that's quite a manifesto. So given that you've got thinkers like that working, um, you know, over the last uh, uh, few years or so, why is it that there is still a deficit in architectural education when it comes to human-centered design and an awareness of the, 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 the influence, the pervasive influence of coloniality um, and uh, these issues of difference? Big it, question, I know. But. No, 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 I was actually talking about yesterday. Um, so, but um, uh, I, I think there, there's a number of things. I think the the lack of change in architectural education, I, I think there's two aspects that my pedagogy is very much about um, when you teach to enable and empower as opposed to educate in a more traditional sense because from, um, you know, I, I very much am um, a fan of... Uh, for our pedagogy of the oppressed, um, when he talks about what are, you know, how do we, you know, the act of teaching to tell somebody to do something in your own reflection is not empowering them and is not really allowing their um, experiences and approach to creating to come through. And I think I think that's part of it. I think the hierarchy of the relationships within education is not um you know, natural to people and students feeling like their opinions matter or their approaches should be um, kind of valued. Um, and also that their own approach towards others within the design process, be it communities, be it, um, you know, normal, you know, average people, um, that, that their uh, opinions are, are important as well. Um, you know, and I think that it's it's this issue, it's it's the hierarchy that, that we've created within our education system, and it's the fact that we continue to perpetuate this behavior of um, a student should needs to do this as opposed to we empower a student to create and to reflect um, communities and people. Um, and, and also just the, the kind of changing role of the architect is not necessarily um, they design and every, they know best. It's for, for, for myself, um, it's more about, as I said, like enabling communities and being a facilitator um, to what people need rather than the imposition of something. And I think that as a concept is something that we can probably relate to every many aspects as that as those that you've, you've touched upon. So. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. So my other question is that um, if you think back over the decades of the 20th century and that that feeling, you know, inherited from way back, you know, going back to the Greek Greeks, that the idea of great public spaces very much about civic and building the civic and the qualities from uh, that they gain through their multifunctionality, the gathering of all peoples and remaining alive through multi you know, multiple uses, but also to demonstrate the quality of urban community and identity in action. So rather than just as an abstract concept, but by the mid 60s in the States, particularly, there were these architectural commentators like Charles Moore, for example. And he said in his critique of American public space that seemed to get an awful lot of attention that public space, it wasn't at all clear what it consisted of uh, and, and who needed it. 
And he was much more interested in thematized urbanism like Disneyland and so on. Um, and conditions that we now, you know, know to, to call neoliberal. How uh, influential do you think those commentators have actually been, given what subsequently happened since the 60s when it comes to the, uh, the inclusiveness of public spaces as, di as directed by certain develop many developers? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that unfortunately those views have kind of come to the forefront a lot more. But I also think that margin, like a lot of communities who don't have access to those spaces make it for themselves, mm. right? Like they, they do. People appropriate space for what they need. And that's that's amazing. And, and actually what people do who are not qualified practitioners can be incredibly inspiring. And that's why I'm always you know, for the idea that we can learn from them just as much we, as we can facilitate and enable that. So I think that while, you know, that approach to formal public space and the design of it ha may have been, you know, now has this neoliberal kind of, you know, approach towards it and, and um, very controlled aspect, there is still this whole level of creating informal space. But what's unfortunate is, you know, it's very limited and it continues to be taken over by you know people wanting to take up more urban space for financial gain and that's kind of what we are losing so it's not that we shouldn't develop spaces we should but let's consider how people already use it and how they want to use those and that that's I think what's lacking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really really interesting and so uh, turning to the audience questions I think you've answered the one about urbanization as colonization of the natural world have you already yeah. while, I, while I was muted by the tech <laughs> you did right okay so um, we'll go on to Alessandro Carlucci uh, and it, he asks what are some of the ways in which as we as architects and uh, designers can encourage clients and stakeholders to open projects up for community discussion engagement and participation and by the way he says your talk is really great Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Um, I think that it, it's really hard. OK, I'm, I'm not going to say it's easy, but um, I think when you try and I think it's about communicating a lived experience as much as you can and trying to. It is about empathy and often it can be hard with specific developers. I've, I've worked, you know, my experience has been with very large developers. I, I won't name any names, but um, quite a lot. And, and I understand the difficulty around that. Um, obviously, we are not as architects necessarily the decision makers, but we are at the table. And so we can always raise it. And one of the things I, I try and remind my architect colleagues who might get um, might forget this is that our code of conduct does say that we need to um, prioritize society over the client um, and that's a pretty big um, you know requirement of our code of conduct and I think that we really need to be adhering to that more um, and uh, yeah and we can just do our best to encourage it and sometimes it's something that kind of goes unpaid a lot of the time. I've just used my connections to say, oh, I spoke to this person, I learned this, and you, it comes naturally. So, and I know that's not the best thing to say because realistically, everything should be paid for. But, you know, sometimes you, you go above and beyond when you believe in something. So hopefully uh, <laughs> there's no straightforward answer. You just do your best to encourage, to be honest, I think. Yeah, and that, actually, that, that's really interesting. Does that that also begs the question? Because um, you're referring, I also to Robert Mull's definition of the architect's role and their duty of care. Um, so, is there a similar, uh, let's say, phrase that relates to the client's duty of care? Now, lots of div private, um, private and public sector developers would say absolutely we really have a strong duty of care towards our local communities. Perhaps they, perhaps they do, but I, I, I do agree that unfortunately they, they, that's not necessarily enacted or a lot of the time things have got round. Or they, I, I think that a lot of it is an approach. A lot mm -hmm. of it tends to be this, let's get it through planning, let's make it happen. Um, and 
you know, an architect often wants to help their client. It's natural to, to be in that, um, you know, get in that mindset. But remembering that actually it's not about maximizing units. It's about trying to create homes that are appropriate or spaces to work that are appropriate and, mm -hmm. and don't have like harmful impact. So mm -hmm. it's to say don't develop, but do it respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, and architects, you kind of are supposed to have that. So, um, oh, so always thinking beyond the red line boundary in, in every sense, really, um, too. So Nana uh, Biyama Ofuzu says, thanks very much for a great presentation. I particularly enjoyed the links you made between the larger systems of colonization and what it means for the built environment. Uh, my question is about how we can progress to a situation where these may be written into the ways we re regenerate areas in a meaningful way. Mm. Is that, you know, how can we achieve that? Yeah, I think I think it's very difficult because, you know, as we, we both kind of said, it, it's it's mu it's very much about empathy and that's a mindset thing. Right. Um, and I think that with a lot of what's happening at the moment in terms of the uh, kind of, uh, you know, unconscious bias and diversity strategies that people are, you know, encouraging and, and doing at work. And hopefully it's the directors who are also doing those um, those courses, because I think it's stuff like that that starts to create that empathy and, and change the view. Um, yeah. So I think that um, that hopefully those things will start to start to encourage people's mindsets because I don't think that these are things that are as effective when um, when just like a list of tick boxes um, because it has to be a holistic mindset and I was talking to somebody the other day about you know the critical friend role so now there's this a lot of companies will will ask to have a critical friend to be playing that role to challenge everyone but ultimately we should not need anyone to do that role it should be natural so um, perhaps the critical friend aspect is something that people, I think, are kind of looking for more within um, their projects going forward. De definitely, definitely. And so the person who um, asked you right at the outset whether you described urbanisation as colonisation of the natural world, um, they've gone on to say thanks a lot. I'm researching biodiversity in urban planning. So the difference between investment in hard and more porous landscapes remains extreme. Is ecological education built into your particular courses? Um, well, I, I mean, that's not the portion that I actually, I teach more about the relationship between practice and acad academia, as opposed to specifically about um, environment. Um, but there, I don't think that there is enough within our discourse at the moment that does concentrate on that understanding. Obviously, it's a little bit of a fine line between, you know, landscape architecture, which is more specialism. But I do think that there should be a greater understanding of, you know, the impact of these things. And I, and I think that there is, um, you know, a lot of stuff happening in that space in terms of ACAN and climate change and encouraging, um, you know, making RIBA criteria accommodate for that. So I think there is some movement there, which is positive. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I, if I remember correctly, one of those reports that you referenced um am i right in saying that was uh, the one relating to landscaping was written by bridget um yeah the, dr. bridget smith dr bridget snaith snaith that's right who teaches at Gre greenwich is it i think you so know? I'm not sure. It's either Greenwich or University of East London. Anyway, she's a, a really, really advanced um, analyst, analyst of these types of um, issues. So very good. And um, I think then someone else followed up the same person who asked the earlier question about biodiversity in cities making a she she or he made a further observation that profit margins for hard landscaping seem to be central drivers currently uh the profit margin for hard landscaping I, i'm not i'm not sure M maybe i'm not i mean i think it depends in what context you're talking about um maybe I'm, in the context of the olympic park as distinct from say uh 
so, I don't know, well, King's Cross is equally kind of high. Yeah, it, it's, high yeah, that, I guess that's true. Although I have, um, when I worked on um, a project for the Olympic Park, I did, I got, um, I got them to instill some allotments and that was like, I mean, the, you pay no money for that, right? So your client's really happy because <laughs> your budget's way much, much lower. So there, but in terms of, I guess the development aspect, like some hardscape is needed because also there, there's a level of accessibility, um, you know, visual difference for people to be able to physically access the space. So I, I think it is a balance, but you're probably right. There is a desire to build more hand, that hardscape. And maybe that's something that, again, needs to be discussed more as an issue. Um, for, for sure. So um, if anyone else would like to ask um, uh, further questions, please do. We have a few more minutes left. So, um, so Sana, while we're waiting to see if anyone would like to, to do that, um, so what what is next for you in your in your uh, professional world um, as we are now hopefully coming out fully from the regulations of lockdown and uh, and so on in the in the imminent future? What do you what have you got on your agenda for the rest of the year? So the, the, so obviously there's kind of three aspects to my work, which is practice um, and then the activism through DCOSM, our research collective and teaching. And they're all kind of interrelated, I'd say. So the projects looking at through practice, um, they're, they're generally varied, but more in a public sphere. Um, and a lot of it is trying to work with councils um, and a lot of collaboration with with um, other groups um, because I think collaboration is really important in getting a diverse kind of skill set and outlook as well. Um, and then a lot of the the research that we've been doing, um, looking at inequity in the built environment, which has been kind of I can't talk too much about everything because until it's out yet. But um, but yeah, there are a few studies that we're looking at, and also in terms of practice, uh, I'm sorry, teaching. Um, yeah, there's some exciting kind of uh, work we're doing where students, um, yeah, are kind of trying to create projects and you know making them happen through um, through understanding policy and understanding different methods of, of practice. So th there's a few different aspects, and we're actually launching as part of Reba Studio, where I examine and teach, which is a course for uh, people who don't, um, for like from non-traditional kind of method of studying architecture, um, they can they can study and work at the same time. So for that, we're also kind of launching a module that looks at these wider issues in practice, so we can develop like a critical view about a lot of contemporary concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Fantastic. Um, so for those of us who are not regularly inside crit, crits examining architectural students, perhaps you can give us a bit of an insight, because um, you said you ex you examine at both Oxford Brooks and the AA, where I think you you originally taught at the AA. Is that right? Um, I write. I don't. I studied at the AA. I didn't teach. Oh, I know. Yeah. I, I do teach one module there. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, no, um, okay, well, like, I think, um, sorry, were you asking more about examining? I was, I was actually, I was asking whether there are actually more discussion, heated even discussions about these very topics within the context of the crits, the final student crits that take place. There I mean, are an examiner obviously are examining them away from the crits, but uh, having been a member of a crit myself, you know, some issues become very, very hot and uh, in fact end up taking quite a bit of time to go go through but you know that these are very very fundamental questions and if if a student's work is uh, somehow lacking in some shape or form there's a lot of really helpful uh, advice you can give to help them evolve before they actually do do their final exams isn't there yeah definitely and i do i think i think you're right i think some of these issues are being discussed much more than they would do and mm. i seen things change and evolve um, and that's from students approaches as well as fellow examiners approaches like when 
you know there are times when you know you as a as a female you're expected to give the opinion on the female thing or something you know like and you know everyone now realizes that that's not okay um, you know so i think things have changed a lot in the past year which is really encouraging mm. um, but yeah and i and i think there are some students who are more uh, forthcoming about having these discussions, but I, I think actually a, a lot of students can, some can be quite scared too. So it, it really kind of depends. Some people really try and be apolitical, yet the project is very political. So I think that um, the th there's been a lot of discussion in the universities about how um, it depends which one as well so like at Central St Martins I'd say a lot of the students are very forthcoming in their opinions and have like strong critique whereas mm. those perhaps are, um, on other courses may, may be less so and so we we are kind of talking a lot about making sure those students have spaces to critique and um, and develop their own critical thinking because that is inevitably what education is about for students to develop their own critical thinking on their project and on wider issues affecting the industry and profession and, and our practice um so yeah the, the, hopefully that that will they will be more encouraged <laughs> well that's really fantastic um i uh i think it's quite um heartening to hear that you know what i suspected which was that there is actually right now a lot more uh critical discussion and uh, forming of critiques which obviously is a, a ongoing process throughout your professional life really ideally um so i see no more questions for for tonight i think um we've covered such a lot of ground really and um sana i think it's just a really fantastic opportunity to focus on your work in this way um you're doing a really incredible um very responsible um um role and service i think by by you know flagging up these very very important issues which can't be overlooked so um thank you really very much for an amazing talk um so i would say also thank you so much to the audience as well and say safe we look forward to seeing you again at future talks um, let me just um, tell you that, uh, remind you that on the 1st of July, we've got the architect Daiwa Kang talking about how architecture can face the future and continue to respect the past all at the same time, focusing on his work on St Andrew Holborn Church, one of Christopher Wren's substantial City of London churches. And then in a month's time, we will announce our exciting programme of autumn online talks with brilliant speakers, including architect, architects uh, Tara Boladay, Julia Barfield, Eric Parry, Neil Pinder, Thomas Kendall at Wayward, and more short films about a myriad of aspects of London, and maybe even a, a film about um, social inclusion through architecture, uh, even, we don't know. We have to have people to propose the ideas, and then maybe we can, We that's what happens, we actually help to facilitate them to make short films so if anyone's interested please get in touch with us so check the temple bar trust events web page for details announced there and um, we will update you in due course so thanks again very much everybody thanks sana and thank you paul see you all again soon bye thanks bye bye